as we stand between between Christmas and the new year, I would like for us to light the Christ candle and uh, hear the story told once again. From Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. <clears throat> As this candle burns, as this candle burns, let us let us look to that flame as a reminder of God's ever-present Spirit. May it flicker in our lives and light us up, that others may see God's light shining uh, in us, and we might light this world. Let us go to our Lord in prayer at this time. We praise you, Lord God, because on Christmas Day, your word became flesh. Your word became flesh in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who was born of a woman and walked among us as a man. Help us to imitate you, your incarnation by manifesting our faith in our conduct as well as in our speech. To you, O Lord, we give our honor, praise, worship, and love in the most holy and precious name of the one who is born today because he lives and reigns with you in your glory and in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Gracious God, I'm so thankful for uh, for your spirit of love and light, and uh, you lift our, lifted our spirits this morning as we listened to this song, and as we thought about that, that Christmas morning when you sent us that precious gift of your Son. Lord, may we proclaim that good news throughout uh, all of next year. May Christmas set the tone for what comes later. Christmas is not over. Christmas is just the beginning. May we live for you each and every day. May your spirit unite us as we worship you in this place at this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Kids, I got a question for you. How many days is it until Christmas? You know? Are you counting down? How many? All right. That's absolutely correct. <laughs> 363. That seems like a long ways away. Uh, that's some good math you did. did. Did you know that already? Did you figure that out in your head just now? <laughs> got this. Um, I didn't expect you to have the answer, so I'm so proud of you that you did. Uh, I brought this calendar because that helps me to calculate. I can count all these days and figure it out. Um, and, and a lot of times what I'll do is I'll take a pen. When I get up in the morning, I'll look at today's date and I'll mark out with a, with a pen and X the days as they go along. We talked about Advent calendars and maybe you had some Advent calendars this year to help you count down. And we usually don't start those until December, so we count down with, with something that has uh, you know, 20, 25 things we can check off. But imagine counting down all 363, because we've got a ways to go to get to Christmas next year, as we just celebrated. 363 days, that seems like so far away, but then next thing you know, it'll be here, and, and you'll, you'll wonder where the time went. But can you imagine having to wait even longer? Imagine if you had to wait two years for Christmas. Imagine if you had to wait 10 years for Christmas. In our scripture this morning, we hear about two people, Simeon and, and a prophet named Anna, and they both waited a long time for Christmas. Anna, it says that she was 84 years old and that she came to the temple every day because she just knew that God was going to do something amazing, that God was going to send the Savior of the world. So she got up every morning and she went to the temple wondering, is today the day? And she did that uh, all the way until she was 84 years old. And then on one day when she was there, Mary and Joseph showed up with the baby Jesus. And God let her know that this child, this is the moment that you have been waiting for. This is the child, the Savior, that you have been waiting to be born. And so she went up and, and talked to Mary and Joseph. She got to see the baby Jesus. And she got to celebrate that uh, the, the wait was, was well worth it. Now what she was waiting for was not... Uh, not a toy or a present underneath a tree. What she was waiting for was something even greater, and that's God's gift of his own son and the salvation that comes through him. So as we think we've got to wait a long time, let us remember Simeon and Anna, uh, these, these two older people that, that waited and recognized you know, Jesus when, when he, uh, he came into the temple that day. Let us go to our Lord in prayer at this time. Lord God, none of us like to wait, and uh, as we... As we counted down to Christmas, it got us excited and we couldn't wait. We can't imagine having to wait all of our life to celebrate Christmas just once. We're so thankful that we get to remember this story each and every year. that We get to celebrate it with our family and friends. May we not take that for granted. But Lord, as we listen to the testimony of, of Anna and the excitement that she experienced, may it remind us of the real reason that we celebrate. It's not for the packages. It's not for the things that we unwrap, but for the thing that was wrapped 
in swaddling clothes, a baby, a child, your son, your gift to humanity. Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus because we know you did so out of your love for us. That, uh, that for God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not you know, die but have everlasting life. Lord, we thank you for this good news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, our children are now dismissed for Children's Church at this time. And our scripture comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, beginning with verses 22 through 24. When the time came, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn born male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. There was also a prophet, I'm, I'm skipping to verse 36 here, there was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was widow. She was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. May the Lord bless the reading of this word. I saw a video online, and it was a, an observation challenge. You know, as we go through life, we don't think about all the, the things that we see. And if, if you were, for example, if you were to witness a crime and the police interviewed you, how much detail do you think you could remember of, of what you just experienced when you weren't even paying that close of attention to begin with? So this observation video points that out by giving you a challenge. There are two teams. Uh, they're, they're both playing basketball. There's a team wearing white jerseys and a team wearing black jerseys. And you're supposed to watch the ball and count how many times a white team, team player, a white jersey, passes the ball from one person to the next. And uh, at the end of the video, you're supposed to see if your count is accurate. So I watched and I counted and I counted and I couldn't uh, quite keep up. But I came pretty close. At the end of the video, it said the ball was passed to your team players wearing white jerseys 16 times. I think I got maybe 12 or 13, so I missed a few. It happened so quickly. Then the video said, but did you see the gorilla? And I was like, what? I went back because I didn't want to just trust the replay that they were about to show. I watched the video all over again from the beginning. And sure enough, while that ball is being passed around, a man in a giant gorilla suit walks out, stands right in the middle of all the people, beats his chest, and then walks on off the screen. I never saw it. If, if you look this up on YouTube, you'll find it. Just, just type observation video or, or your gorilla, uh, your invisible gorilla, something like that, and you'll find it. Now that I've told you, it'll spoil it, though, because you'll probably see it. But I promise you, that myself and other people that I showed this video to, nobody ever sees this big giant gorilla. So it makes you wonder, you know, are we really that observant? You know, what are we, what are we paying attention to? What are we missing? Because we don't have our eyes open. And then we come to, to, to Anna. And the reason I'm focusing on Anna in this story is because sometimes I think that she's the invisible uh, gorilla in the story. We've got our nativity set up here. We don't have a little version of Simeon. We don't have a little version of, of Anna. That takes place in the scripture right after uh, the, the nativity elements that we are, are used to. So we don't, we don't remember these, these two people, uh, these two senior citizens who proclaim that Jesus is the Christ child. And then in particular, we skip over Anna because uh, the verses I left out, Simeon, 
the Lord inspires him to speak, and there's this long paragraph. We have all these words of, of Simeon. Anna, however, is the one who has identified as a prophet. And to be a prophet, that simply means to be the mouthpiece of God. A prophet is someone who speaks on God's behalf. God sends that word and, and the person speaks. Uh, I also like to think of prophets as being preachers because prophets inspired by that word from God would go out in the streets. They would go around. They would, would proclaim their message. We see prophets throughout the Old Testament who would, would challenge the authorities of, the, of, of their day. Prophets, God would send a message by the prophets to talk to the kings and important people and tell them what they were doing right, what they were doing wrong, and what God wanted them to change. So prophets are known for speaking, yet we don't have a single word quoted in Scripture from Anna. So I feel like Anna has been overlooked now, I don't blame Luke because probably Luke was operating on the information that he was given. And, uh, and people didn't take the time to, to listen and record what Anna had to say. So we have a general idea of what she talked about, but we don't have a sermon uh, manuscript by the prophet Anna. I also want to focus on Anna because it's significant that just as we talked about how we might miss that, that 800-pound gorilla in the room, so many people missed Christ. The religious leaders, they didn't know Christ was born. Uh, Herod uh, was concerned when he found out that Christ was born, but he wasn't even able to figure out a way to find him. Yet the wise men do, the shepherds do. There are some people that, that, that see, that get the memo and seek out and they see and they find and they discover and they have an encounter with Christ where there are so many others, the, the mass majority, that just do not. But Anna, she's on that list of people who saw. It was just an average family on an average day coming into the temple to, to go through what the law said about, about you know, dedicating the firstborn, doing the, the appropriate sacrifices, nothing out of the ordinary, yet it didn't slip by without notice. Anna saw. Anna observed. Anna saw Christ. So what made Anna so special? How was she able to see when so many other people were not able to see and recognize the Christ child? Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God. She, she came up to them and immediately knew this is the Savior of the world, the one that we've all been waiting for. Before we talk about how Anna could see, I, I wanted to, to tell you about a Swiss engineer, George De uh, David Straw, he saw what others missed. He used to like to hike in the uh, the Alps, and one thing that he observed when he got done hiking is those little things that would be stuck to his his socks. Those little seeds with the spikes on them, they get stuck to your socks, and you got to pick them off. Uh, not only do they get stuck on, on on socks, but they stick on the fur of animals that brush by them. If he took his dog out walking with him when he got home, he'd have to pick those things off of his dog. So those seeds are considered a nuisance. It's a, a smart way that the seed has uh, it decides to get around. You know, uh, God gave the, the seed those spikes to transport it from place to place so that it can continue to grow. But most people just look at it as being a, a nuisance. Well, this Swiss engineer decided to take a closer look at these seeds and how they worked. And so he observed them. He, he observed their behavior. He looked at them under a microscope. He saw the way that the barbs on the, those seeds were designed and decided to try to mimic that in, in something that, that he could make. Sure enough, this laid the groundwork for a modern invention that has been to the moon and back, and that is Velcro. So every time you use Velcro, I want you to remember that it's all because a Swiss engineer saw a problem, opened his eyes, observed it, and out of what seemed like a problem came a, a very important solution that we use every day of our life. So what would happen if we opened up our eyes if rather than just letting the problems in life be something that irritates us what if we opened our eyes to the opportunities that each problem presents rather than seeing them as problems we can see them as challenges we've had our share of challenges in 2020 those problems are not going to naturally or just automatically go away just because the clock strikes 12 and, and we go from 2020 to 2021 a lot of those problems are going to follow us, but maybe we should view those problems as opportunities, as challenges to be overcome and open our eyes. So what helped Anna to see? What helped her to observe? How was she able to see that 
this child that came into her presence was something special. And one thing that I, I look at, uh, I looked at was all the details we have about her life. And she was a widow at a very young age, but we don't even know her husband's name. Instead, we know her father's name. Her father's name, it says in verse 35, she was the daughter of, of Penuel. Isn't that strange for someone who's 84 years old to be remembered, not by their former husband, but by their father? Uh, yeah, who, who around knew this, this, this woman's father? You know, Think about how old you'd have to be to know the father of this 84-year-old. So Penuel obviously had a reputation that was long-lasting. He had a long-lasting impact on the community. I don't know much about him. I don't know much about Anna, but, if, but I do know this, that the word Penuel has a meaning behind it, and uh, it means the face of God. And we see another place where it's a variation of, of a spelling of the same word, but in Genesis 32, we hear uh, this, this word come up again. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God's face, I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. This is where Jacob wrestles with God. And so he names the place at basically the face of God because that's where he saw God face to face. I wonder if this then became a, a framework for how Anna's dad faced life. Was Anna's dad known as one who didn't shy away from challenges, but, but faced them head on? Was he one who wrestled with life was he one that wrestled with faith and doubts? Was he one that wrestled with God? Because he wasn't one who shied away from challenges, but embraced them, knowing that, that God would help him through. <clears throat> and if this is the reputation that, that Anna's father had, and then you looked at the, look at the difficult life that she had, did she imitate her father in this trait as well? And maybe that's why this many years later that we remember her as Anna, the daughter of Penuel, one who also knows what it's like to wrestle with God. It's important to notice that, that Anna had a good father, a good mentor in her life, someone who, who set the example, someone who was a spiritual leader. If her father continued to embrace and wrestle with God his whole life, then he's probably the one that taught her to come to the temple, to be in God's presence, so you can be as close to the face of God as you, as you can get. So he was a spiritual leader in the household. For, for us men, that, that tells us that we need to, to make sure that we are setting the right example for, for our family, for our, our, our children, uh, for other family members that look to us as a role model. We need to, to be involved uh, in, in, in the church. We need to, to make our faith known to those that we influence. And, uh, and then you know, for, for his daughter to grow up, and to take on a, a very you know, dominant role in, in worship, to be known as a prophet. There are several prophets that we hear about in, in Scripture, female prophets. Um, but they, you know, certainly there are more male prophets than female prophets. For her to be remembered, it, she was a significant leader of the faith community in her day. She was remembered for her faith. She also remembered where she came from. We picked up uh, on that in Scripture. It says that, uh, that she was from the tribe of, of Asher. So where does Asher come from? What does that tell us? Uh, back in Genesis 30, verse 12, it says, Leah's servant, uh, servant Zilpah, bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, How happy I am. The women will call me happy. So she named him Asher. The name Asher means happy. For, for Anna to be remembered as being from Asher, maybe she had a pleasant disposition. Maybe she was remembered not for the complaints and, or the negative attitude that she had, but for being a positive person, an encourager, someone that you could feel happy when you were around because you could see the joy in her life. But then you fast forward a few years and see what happened to the tribe of Asher. Asher was in the Northern Kingdom. The Northern Kingdom was taken over by the Assyrians long before the Southern Kingdoms uh, were taken over by, uh, by the Babylonians. So before the Babylonian exile, you had uh, Assyria taking out a lot of these, these northern tribes. Here she is in Jerusalem, where people are still remembering and retelling the history of the Babylonian exile. And she comes there with the history of her own people. She is, is 
is coming from a perspective of one who is very aware of, of the politics of her time, of, of the implications that, that Rome is still uh, over top of them, that they don't have their freedom or independence. This is why she is yearning for the coming of the Messiah. For the sake of her people, of her ancestors, she wants to see the Savior come. So this helps to give her the vision for the future that enabled her to be where she needed to be to, to run in, into Christ because she remembered the struggles of her people. She remembered where she came from and she took that knowledge with her into where she was heading. Now the name Anna comes from the Hebrew Hannah and we do have some uh, Hannah in scripture as well. The name itself means grace. So obviously Anna is, is someone who is familiar with the grace of God, and uh, and she enabled that enabled her to face the challenges in life. When she made mistakes, she knew that she was covered by the grace of God that enabled her to get up each day and try harder the next. But it also causes me to think back to Hannah in Scripture, and in First Samuel twenty four and twenty eight, we hear this: uh, After he was weaned, she took the boy. This is uh, the she here is Hannah. She took the boy with her, young as he was, along with with a three year old bull and an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And then it goes on to say, So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. This is the scene where Samuel, the firstborn of Hannah, is consecrated to the Lord. And that's the exact setting of what is taking place here in Scripture, that Jesus, like Samuel, is being consecrated to the Lord. And like Samuel, he would be given to the Lord in service for the rest of his life. The fact that Anna is the one that recognized this, I imagine that she probably was very familiar with the story of Hannah in the Old Testament. I know I know everything uh, about Philip in the Bible just because my name is Philip. If you have a biblical name, you probably know some things about the biblical character that you're named after. Well, she would have known this story. It probably would have grieved her a bit because she was so young when, when she became a widow that, that she might not have had an opportunity to have a family herself. So was she robbed of that experience as she went to the temple each and every day? Did she see families coming in and celebrating, consecrating their firstborn and feel like she was left out of that? But regardless, she took notice and it gave her the eyes to see. Once again, here is a family that is consecrating a child, but this time it's different because she, she was led to see that it was the Christ child. Life did not come easy to her. As, as we've already heard, she was widowed at a young age. She probably had a lot of financial concerns. She had a lot of struggles in life. Life was hard on her. Life was, probably took its toll on her you know, physically, yet she, she continued to push forward. The fact that she was able to be at the temple every day at her age, it meant that, that she was in pretty good health, that she pushed herself. She, she did the physical therapy. She probably walked there. You know, she wouldn't have had a car to get there. So she did all that she could to be in shape so that she could be there for worship. Uh, through fasting and prayer, that we know that, that, that she, uh, she didn't let food rule her life. So she probably was, was physically fit and ate, ate the right things. But life did not come easy for her. She had to, to exercise and work hard to be where she was. Uh, she had lived with her husband seven years after after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. So for, for all those years, she's had to fend for herself. She became a very strong and independent woman through the, the hardship that she experienced. So looking back on those hard years, she would say, oh, that's, that's what created me. That's what developed me into the person I am today. Let me tell you about the Mario effect. When I was a kid, I got uh, a Nintendo and started playing Super Mario. And the, the thing that's neat about that is that you come across an obstacle, and if you fail, you get to try it again. And, and, and the challenge of, of the game, of trying to overcome one obstacle after the other, knowing that I can always just you know, hit restart and try it again and again until I get it right, that's what keeps you going. Life is full of obstacles. What if we approach life like a video game? What if we approach life knowing that, okay, I'm gonna have obstacles in my pathway today, and sometimes I'm gonna get it right, and sometimes I'm gonna get, get it wrong. And when I get it wrong, that's not devastating. That is a lesson. That is an opportunity for me to come back tomorrow and try it again. If we had that type of attitude, if we had the, the Super Mario effect in our daily life, it would help us 
to keep pushing forward when life uh, tries to knock us down. Anna had this type of approach to life. That's how she survived 84 years of being an independent woman and, and facing each day with its, with its challenges with a positive attitude. You see, we have this idea of how we think life is going to be. On that top image there, you know, this is your, your idea of your plan for life. You know, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to get there. And everything is going to go smoothly. This is what we hope happens. But then in the picture beneath it, this is what reality tends to look like instead. Can you relate to that? And, and we might get up, be, be upset. Why couldn't, why couldn't things go according to our plan? And when things don't go according to our plan, we get all bent out of shape. But if you were to play a video game, which of these two scenarios would be the more interesting video game? Which of these two scenarios would sharpen your skills and prepare you better for the next challenge? Naturally, the bottom. And so life looks more like, like the bottom. We might not understand uh, why we're going through this difficulty at the time, but when we look back, we can see the, the things that it taught us and have made us a better person. So may we have a positive attitude, even in the midst of, of struggles, the way Anna did, because it might help us to get to that finish line and, and be a stronger person because of it. Anna was able to see what others did not see because she positioned herself. She positioned herself to receive a word from God. She positioned herself to be there when God acted. Uh, we, we just went through Black Friday sales and it was different for a lot of people this year. You, the, a lot of people did most of their shopping online. So you were robbed of that experience and standing in long lines. One tradition every year at places like Best Buy and, and other stores that have those special sales is that people will actually camp out. They'll set up tents and camp out with, you know, the night before so they can be there bright and early. They want to position themselves so they can be in the queue line and get that item that they want. Well, that is what uh, Anna did by, by worshiping in the temple day and night. She wanted to be there. She, she knew that God was going to act in her lifetime, and she didn't want to miss it. So she positioned herself to, to be in the optimal position to receive a word from the Lord. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day. She didn't allow her age to be an excuse. She could have said, well, I'm 84, and I'm just going to sleep in today. She could have done that, and if she'd have done that the day that Mary and Joseph came, she'd have missed out on a great blessing. But instead... She, she allowed the purpose that she received from, from worshiping God and, and, and being God's prophet, she allowed that purpose to motivate her to get up uh, each and every day. That's what kept her going. She outlived so many of her peers because she, she received that purpose from her Lord and it kept her, her going each and every day. Uh, she also connected with like-minded believers. Once she discovered that the Christ child was in her presence. She didn't keep that a secret and said it says she spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. She began by going to people that that she knew. You know, how did she know how did she know the people she talked to were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem? These weren't strangers. These were people that she had had conversations with over and over. Maybe she began with a small group that would be equivalent to our, our Sunday school classes. So she went and she talked to her Sunday school class members because they had had these conversations. They were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Maybe she had gotten into a discussion out in the temple courts with some of her neighbors. And she knew that they too were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. By being a part of, of, of a, a group of fellow believers that sharpened each other, that discussed each and every week, she knew who to turn to. And so she surrounded herself with like-minded believers to help her stay on track and to, and to keep her eyes open as well. That's why it's important that we come together. It's important that, that we not try to, to, to worship God in, in, in complete isolation, but that we connect and bounce our ideas off of our, our family, our friends, our church family, that we be part of, of, of small groups and, and and take things like Sunday school class seriously because it helps us to open our eyes that we might not miss what God is doing right in front of us. She prayed. If she had not had an active prayer life, then she could not have been a prophet. She could not have had, had detected the movement of the spirit that led her to that family at that particular moment. How is your prayer life? Do you only pray when you need something or do you pray every day? We need to pray every day so that we can be ready to receive that message from the Lord whenever he sends it and shares it with us. Fasting and praying. So she took it very seriously. She, she fasted, which means that she not only prayed with her mind, but she involved her entire uh, body. 
uh, and, and all that she did, she lived a life of prayer. And she gave thanks. She lived a life of thanksgiving. That's what helped her to face obstacles uh, and, and, and to, to worship and, and praise God for all the good things that he did. She had something every day that she could go to that temple and thank him for. And it says she gave thanks to God when she realized that the Christ child had been, been, been born and given to the world. Verse 38, she gave thanks to God. We should take a lesson there too and live lives of thanksgiving. We prepared for Christmas by celebrating first Thanksgiving. And we see Anna doing the very same thing. She celebrated Christmas through Thanksgiving. And then she didn't keep that knowledge to herself. She told others. And she spoke about the child. Not only was she a prophet, but, it, but she was also an evangelist. One who tells the good news. And that should inspire each and every one of us. The way we should respond to Christmas is by telling others. Not just by hoarding the blessings for ourselves. Christmas is not about the packages we received and filling up our drawers with more useless junk. It's about receiving the good news that we might go out and tell others. Who do you need to tell? Who, who can you share the good news with in the upcoming year that it might make a difference in their life? What am I going to say when I get there? She didn't worry about that. Her speech was God-empowered. There was also a prophet Anna, to be called a prophet means one who is a mouthpiece of, uh, of God, one who receives a message and then proclaims that message. God will give you the words to speak when you are willing to be a vessel of his good news and to go out and share that good news. In the Old Testament, it says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. This scripture is quoted later by Peter when he's trying to explain what, what he sees happening in the, on the day of Pentecost. When he hears God's words being proclaimed and the good news being spoken by people young and old, by male and female, by people of all walks of life. This was promised in the Old Testament and we see the fulfillment here in Anna. We see it later in the daughters of, of Philip. We see it as, as women became significant leaders in the church as we read uh, through the scriptures and as we study church history. I will pour out my spirit on all people. The fact that it's not just Simeon who delivers this news to us uh, in Luke, Luke chapter 2, but the Luke would include both Simeon and Anna is to remind us that, we, that, that God's message is all-inclusive, that it's for all people, that it's delivered by all people. And then that comes to us. This whole time we've been looking and listening to what Anna did. We've been thinking about the qualities that enabled her to see. We need to imitate those qualities because we need to become a God reporter. We need to open our eyes. We need to be more observant. We need to pay more attention to the hand of God in our life, in our community, in the lives of others. We need to observe. We need to take a closer look. Just as that... Um, that engineer used a microscope to look closer. We've been given scripture that we might read and familiarize ourselves with how God works so that we can then spot the work of God in our world. We need to be God reporters in that we do our investigative journalism each day that we live our life looking for, for God uh, among us. But then not only that, we need to go and report. We need to tell that good news to others. It says, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. 1 Peter 3.15. People, when they see the joy that is in your life, you need to be able to get testimony to that. You need to be able to explain to people why you go to church, why you believe in Jesus. You need to be able to share with them what God is doing in your life so you can help them to see what God is trying to do in their life. But not only that, we need to do so with gentleness and respect. That means that as we, as we report to others, we don't just need to hit people upside the head with the good news, but we need to package it and present it in such a way that it will be heard, that it will be received. And gentleness means that we need to do just as much listening in the conversation as telling. But through building relationships, we will be given opportunities to speak a word of truth. Anna had built relationships. She knew who had the common interests who was receptive to the, to the good news so that when she encountered the Christ child, she was able to go to them and tell them the good news that a Savior had been born. Christmas has come, and Christmas is 
is quickly becoming about you behind us, but the future that Christmas is carving out for us has just begun. In the new year, I want you to be a God reporter and report the good news of what God is doing in your life. With that in mind, let us go to our Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for loving us and leading us. We thank you for all the, the opportunities that you give us each day. And Lord, how many times have you been doing something and we, we missed it because we weren't paying attention? Maybe we missed what you were doing because we, uh, we weren't worshiping like we should be. And, our, and so our mind just wasn't thinking about you. Maybe we've neglected our prayer life and you've been trying to tell us something over and over. But we haven't heard because we haven't been taking that time to speak and listen to you. Lord, maybe we need to do some fasting. Maybe there's some things we need to remove from our life that is becoming a distraction. That if we can set aside and live without those things for just a few moments, it might enable us to come closer to you. Lord, I pray that in, in 2021 that we would draw closer to you. That we would worship you not just once a week, but each and every day. That we might live a little bit more like Anna. That our eyes might be opened. Maybe the answer to our problems has been right under our nose and we just haven't taken the time to look. Lord, may we receive the power of your Holy Spirit and, and your guidance on our life. May we be like Anna in that we become prophets, those who receive a word from you and are not af afraid to share that with those who need to hear it. Lord, as we proclaim the good news, may we do so in such a way that creates an attractive witness. May we speak to others with gentleness and respect, not with, with arguments or attacks, but speak in such a way that entices them to want to know more. Lord, may we be able to, to share with others the, the reason for the joy that we have in our life, and may we live in such a way that makes people curious about, uh, about our relationship with you. Lord, we pray for all those in our community that, that have not come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We know that you love them and that your blessings are waiting for them. May we experience the joy of being the person that, that gets to introduce them to you and, and, and watch the unfolding as they recognize that indeed the Savior has come. Thank you for sending your, your, your son to us. May that Savior continue to, to empower us to face whatever ever obstacles and challenges life throws at us. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing our closing hymn, Angels, from the realm of glory, if you have never made the decision to accept the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior, we encourage you to come forward and receive baptism in this church. If you're already a baptized believer and would like to transfer your, your membership, we would welcome you with open arms into this family of faith. Regardless, all of us, as we sing this song, may we reflect on our need to be God reporters and spread the good news beyond these church walls. Let us stand as we sing. <laughs> share the good news and explain what Christmas is all about. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.